I call the meeting to order at 6.13. Cameraman ready? Okay. Can we vote on the uh, minutes of last month's meeting? Yeah. Um, I make a, oh wait, I can't vote. Correct. Sorry. Okay. No, I can't vote. Motion. Motion to approve the minutes. Can you guys uh, do stuff back for Jonathan? You bet. Discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Zach, we'll start off with you with the uh, Zach report of the month. The Zach report of the month. What about the process? All right, director's report. Um, I was recently in front of the Whaley Select Board, um, just giving an update, and as chance would have it, South County EMS. Uh, experienced some simultaneous calls a couple days before. It was like Murphy's Law. Bad time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, for frame of reference, we uh, respond to about a thousand calls for service a year. And uh, from our data and estimation, 1% of those end up going to mutual aid. Um, so about 10 calls a year were unable to respond. And it happened two days before that. And there was an extended response time for the mutual aid ambulances. So we discussed what that is, what that means, um, and I think, um, you know, obviously uh, there's a bigger discussion to be had around that. Um, we, we respond to 99% of our calls. Do we want to be the type of department that 1% goes to mutual aid, that we never have to rely on mutual aid or, or whatever, and, and what does that mean as far as um, finances go? The other issue is what steps can we take immediately to help lower those chances or at least help um, shorten that time. So would it be automatic mutual aid response <clears throat> um, more quickly in the event that our primary ambulance is already on a call? Um, notification of our staff beforehand if we think the primary ambulance is going to be out of service or extended period of time. All those things, operational things um, that we can take tomorrow that I can take tomorrow to make sure that um, we try to limit that. I did mention in my report <clears throat> um, kind of a big picture thing about um, staffing, just kind of a historical. We used to rely heavily during the day on our call staff. And when we created this regional service, we did it because we didn't have the local EMTs anymore. And even the, the report was like, hey, you know, keep, keep using them, keep them involved, but after about three years, we expect that you're gonna see that drop off. And we saw that during the day, that drop off happened um, within like a year and a half. And that was the impetus for us creating that impact shift. So instead of relying on people who would be around during the day, we would actually put somebody physically in the station. Um, it's been a huge benefit. Um, the amount of times that we were relying on mutual aid for those daytime calls, our busiest hours, uh, in this case, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., dropped off. Or we were able to respond to those calls, whereas in the past we were relying on mutual aid for them. So um, the impact shift worked very well for that. Um, the other thing it does is it keeps those members involved in uniform in the station around the equipment. Um, and it also allows us to pull staff from a wider geographical area. So right now for these overnight shifts, these on-call shifts, we're limited to the EMTs that can actually physically respond from their house. So these three towns of uh, proximity. And I pull reports on a regular basis. I know what EMTs and paramedics live in our three towns and I know what their status is, whether they're on our department, they're not interested in being our department and things like that. So by adding the on-duty shift for that 10 to six, we're able to pull people from Northampton or Amherst or Leverett um, to do that. Uh, food for thought, I mean, there's going to be increased cost associated with that um, just by the nature of putting somebody in uniform in the station, but I kind of wanted to at least get those gears rolling now. I've got all the financial figures and estimations for that, but um, you know, we'll, we'll take the easy steps and see. see how well it just getting back to the to the to the example that that Whaley had a couple Mondays ago, month three Monday, which which yeah, Monday it was, yeah. um, and I thought the meeting went great. Thank you for coming, by the way. Um, it, it just strikes me, and we talked about it a little bit in the, in the meeting. <clears throat> if there's no call staff 
that has said, yes, I'm around. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting by the phone. Then while we can tone them out, we really should simultaneously right. tone other towns out and not wait. And if we have to call somebody off, yep. so be it. But the, we shouldn't be waiting that five or ten, seven minutes, whenever, however long it is. Because yeah. there's just no reason to wait. Right. And, I, and I guess I thought we had talked about that in the past anyway and that had been implemented. And perhaps not. Um, I'm not as young and... I agree with I agree you. With know, that. But yeah. it, we should just adopt that as a policy right away. That, and, and if we don't need the intercept, great. If yeah. all of a sudden someone is, like, is around because they're around, and then great. But we can't, we can't sit around waiting yeah. for them just in, if no one's called. Right, and we have a saying, it's easier to turn somebody around than, yeah. than to get them started before you would ask. So, and if that yeah, saves absolutely. five minutes, and who knows, it may save longer because they may have gotten a call in that five minute right. span of time right, right, right. really even longer. You just never know. So yeah. what's the what's the harm? Yeah. Yeah. I, I that's what you're saying. Go right out to the that's Go right exactly, out. Right. Call everybody. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what Zach and I were talking about before the meeting. Yeah. You know, start the mutual aid coming in sooner and Right. No harm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sounds good. I'll touch base with our counterparts of, who are on our mutual aid run order. Typically, the, the courteous thing to do here is to talk to those people, say, this is how many times we would estimate that you'd be called, you know, and so they can either prepare or we can adjust our mutual aid order, but absolutely, like... It's not yeah. going to be met often. It's not going to be often at all. It's not going to be often at all, but I just, if they're listening, I don't want them to think that I'm going to... Um, make a, a huge change that's going to affect their departments. All right. <clears throat> so I, I, I just, I, I thought that it was, fortuitous isn't the right word, because you never want to wish that on someone else. Right. But, but it was timely that we could have, that we could have that conversation and begin the, how do we deal with this? Yeah. Because clearly it was a hole mm -hmm. in our strategy. Right. So I, I, I thought it was great and everyone was very receptive and I thought John was, was fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. Good. Yeah. Um, outreach tomorrow, uh, the hard knocks exercise was canceled. Turns out that when the federal disaster team responds to actual emergencies um, all summer, they don't want to do an exercise anymore. But Franklin Medical Center is going to be hosting an MCI drill um, tomorrow. And basically what they're testing is their decontamination procedures. If their emergency department is overwhelmed with uh, patients who are contaminated with some sort of hazard, how does their hospital deal with that? Because it's a pre-hospital event, um, in, in theory, South County EMS is going to be providing the pre-hospital providers. So we're going to be setting up um, four providers, including myself. Um, our third ambulance will be going up dedicated to the shift, and our second line ambulance will be going up in service, but will be up there um, to also help out. And we're going to be the only ambulance service, the only pre-hospital emergency medical services represented at this drill. So um, I'm pleased that we can be a part of that. They've also asked me to give a primer on uh, pre-hospital emergency triage for their hospital staff. This is kind of, um, they're looking at, at this opportunity and our involvement to really get their staff up to speed. So they know what to expect, what we're going to be doing in the field and how they're going to be receiving patients. So. That'll be a just-in-time training with them tomorrow at 8 in the morning. The drill will start at 9 and probably run about an hour, hour and a half. So um, that'll be really, really good. I just want to interrupt one minute and just um, say at the Homeland Security meeting this Tuesday, um, the MCI plan was talked about, um, the Franklin County plan, and the South County EMS role in it and how everybody is watching it. And they are looking forward to the results and the after action report, and then it's going to probably find its way through Central Mass and the rest of Western Mass because, as a model, um, because there are very many MCI plans that people actually have drilled. So, thank you, Zach, for doing that, yeah. and it really uh, reflects well on on South County EMS. Yeah, as a nature of Franklin County, we don't like Central Mass or 
you know, southern Massachusetts with a lot of big municipalities and a lot of backbone infrastructure. We really have to rely heavily on each other. So it means that we're lacking in a lot of areas as far as resource goes, but it means it forces us to work together to make these MCI plans and stuff like that. So we're, our hand is forced to look at the bigger picture stuff, and we really are a, a model for the other, um, really? other regions but in the it, state. It was, I, I, it was just a, the discussion, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're talking about it. Um, how wonderful we are. So um, I, I just really yeah. appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. For that. And part of that, I mean, we've been very proactive with education and training for our staff um, ongoing, trying to really bolster up the, the knowledge base of our department. Uh, Coleraine Ambulance um, is almost our contemporary. They're not a regional service, but they're very proactive. They've become the paramedic level ambulance and they're doing the intercepts for West County. So I spoke with uh, the director of Coleraine Ambulance. Um, which is easy, he works for us full time, uh, Gary Ponce. Um, but I spoke to him uh, as him being the director of Coleraine, and we talked about joint trainings, kind of bolstering EMS in the county, and we were thinking about how a lot of the police departments, the fire departments, they look at regional responses. So we have a regional technical rescue team on the fire side that is able to provide these resources and stuff like that. And so we were thinking between the two departments, how could we work together, work with FERCOG, work with the state, um, and try to get some resources that we could actually become you know, a, a better regional service for everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, we've just started kind of putting some stuff down back then up and stuff, and so hopefully we'll have some, um, some updates on that uh, in the near future. Well, wow, thank you, Zach. Uh, we had uh, money left over in the candle donation fund. Um, they're very generous to uh, give us money on a fairly regular basis, and we're going to spend it for um, state-of-the-art video laryngoscope devices. So when an advanced provider or paramedic, when we intubate a patient, so we put a tube in their uh, trachea, their windpipe, to breathe for them in either a respiratory or cardiac arrest, it, it looks like a big metal spoon, and we're literally just opening up their mouth and kind of gazing down. And that can get very complicated if you have somebody who has a lot of injuries or things like that. Um, it can be difficult. So this, these new devices, it's actually a camera down at the very far tip. And you insert it, it actually requires less manipulation of the anatomy, so it's safer for the patient. And there's a video screen, so instead of having your face right up against the patient, you can look back just like you look at your cell phone and you can see the vocal cords in this case and we can intubate very easily. Mm -hmm. um, it's cool. shown to prove, it's proven to be um, incredibly beneficial and improve uh, outcomes for cardiac and respiratory arrest. And the added benefit of this is these devices, the one that we've selected, actually records video clips um, the same way our cardiac monitor does. So we can attach that and import it to our permanent patient care report record, and we can even show it to the respiratory staff in the emergency department. Because part of the problem is when we intubate a patient in the field, they need to confirm that it was done correctly and or it hasn't become dislodged. And we can show unequivocally firsthand, hey, doc, you see, there it is going through the vocal cords, and they can feel good about uh, what it is instead of wasting time for an x-ray or something like that. So um, we're excited to deploy these. Should be in the very near future. It'll be with all of our paramedic here, so on Ambulance 1 and 2. Um, so that'll be uh, a resource for our community. Is, is the idea not to damage the vocal cord, or that's right where you want to get it? That's, um, we use the vocal cord as a landmark for when we intubate. We actually pass the endotracheal tube through the vocal cords. Okay. Um, and that's yep. just the way the anatomy is. You can't really see far past the vocal cords, but right. you don't need to. You know you're in the trachea. So yeah. um, that camera is as if you're standing right at the vocal cords. Gotcha. So, um, it'll also help with pediatric intubations as well. Thankfully, we don't have to do many of those. Right. Um, but those can be extraordinarily difficult for a myriad of reasons. So mm -hmm. um, this is specifically designed as a pediatric mode to help with that. Great. Great. Um, and then the last thing on my list is this big question of debt collection write-offs we've been talking about. Um, in the packets you have, um, there were some questions previously. I've included, um, there's uh, that page that says current 31 to 60, 61 to 90 in my handwriting. That's the amount of uncollected um, charges outstanding that we currently have. Um, so it's divided. Uh, in this case, since Comstar was uh, the town of Deerfield's collection agency before South County EMS, it's, it's divided up in between the two. 
So as of this report, um, which was uh, about a week ago, a week and a half ago, outstanding uncollected is 314,534. That's over 120 days. Um, this is what we'd be looking at when we're talking about our collections policy and things like that. So that's about the amount of money that... Um, do, you, do you have a handle on, Zach, um, most, most insurances pay before the 120 days? Yeah. Um, what what is Medicare and Medicaid averaging? Are they going over the 120? That's I mean, a great question. I don't know. Okay, because I, I I'm, I'm just I, I should have asked Brenda that question because mm -hmm. I um, the number looks so huge and we are actually our collection percentage is high. So right. so I don't know ultimately if if it's just slower. I mean, the, the reimbursement rate is slower than the 120. If I had been a betting man, I would have said that they're paying on time, but they only pay a fraction. And that fraction will vary on, yeah. well, if, if we think that a run should cost $5, they'll only pay $3. Or, or, and it'll vary from insurance company to insurance company or Medicaid to Medicare. My guess is that's that number because they nobody ever pays 100%. And, you, and, and one of the reasons why, again, just historical perspective in Waverly, we wrote off all of these was because once, let's say Blue Cross, had paid their 75%, I'm just picking a number, I don't know what their, what their reimbursement rate is, they're not gonna pay more. And it's really not fair to go to the patient and say, well, you know, your insurance only covered 75% of the cost of, it is what it is, and we just write off the remainder. So my guess is that's what that is. All right. Well, we should probably sort that out. If if you I, flip, I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. That if out. you flip to the next pages, they're labeled activity tracking report. I had these uh, generated. They're actually broken down by fiscal year, um, 15, 16, 17. I actually think it might go 17, 16, 15 yep. in your packet. It's great. Looking back in time, um, and this is exactly what John was talking about. So you'll see under. Um, like Medicaid, Medicare, total charges and total allowable. So, oh, yeah, it's a huge so yeah, so that difference is, is exactly what John was saying, was that Medicaid negotiates, basically says, too bad, so sad, we don't care what you're charging us, this is what you're going to get. Um, so we actually, when you're looking at these percentages, they're calculated off of what we expect to get, what the allowable is. Um, okay, so we're going to have to figure out. I mean, when we're looking at the bottom line, yeah. the bottom line could be very distorted. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as a, you know, for patients with insurance, our collection rates are in the mid-90s, which is exceptionally good. Um, but they're still at 75%, 65%, whatever it is. Um, in total. So if you look down to the self-paid people, mm -hmm. so these are people that <clears throat> don't have insurance, period. Um, their insurance information wasn't collected for whatever reason, or John Doe's, things like that. Um, or people who say were in a car accident, their automobile insurance denied the claim, and so it becomes a self-paid, and like, it's sometimes you can get out and be like, the, the patient has to talk to the medical insurance, stuff like that. Of those patients, that's where we see the very small return, because these are the, these are the people that get a bill um, and don't respond, that we don't even see any sort of percentage with. Uh, FY16 was particularly low, um, and I don't have it in front of me. I researched that at the end of that fiscal year, and from, I recall, it was one or two uh, patients that they were transported by air ambulance, and their bill was $30,000, and they were John Doe's, you know, that type of thing. So that really dragged down that total percentage. But um, at the very bottom line, uh, to be in the mid-80s as far as total collection, which includes our, our self-pays, um, is, still, is still very good. And that's kind of representative of our demographic. Um, and also the data collection that we do in the uh, um, partnership we have with the billing company where they can <clears throat> access that data electronically and immediately. There's no delay there. Jack, I have a question of what you just said. If, if someone's air lifted, how is uh, South County responsible for that bill? So typically it, what happens is the ambulance service that transports the patient mm -hmm. 
builds the patient. Anybody else that kind of lends resources, so if we intercept somebody or if we transport a patient to uh, like the, the helipad or the hospital or something like that, we bill the patient for everything. Um, and that includes our billing company getting the patient care reports from the other services. And then... The other services bill us? Yeah. So if we, and I think I got this, but I just want to be clear. If we transport somebody from Waitley to the helipad in Greenfield, and then they're so, so bad they need to go to Bay State by helicopter, we pay that bill and we try to collect the money from the patient. Um, generally speaking, the specific situation of what helicopters or things like that, I can't speak to that with any sort of affirmation right now, but typically that's how it works. So like if we receive an intercept or something like that, if we receive additional resources, um, only one person bills the patient um, is how it's supposed I, to. I don't, I don't think that we pay the helicopter. Yeah, and I'm right, and I've never seen a helicopter bill, so that's why I'm like, well, that's I, that's I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. No. right. Um, well, we, but the, where, we, where we're saving all kinds of money is what, as, the as, as a bench, right, the basic, you know, if they needed, you know, advanced care or advanced life support, then we would have to pay intercept charges. So we would collect like practically nothing, and then we would be charged the intercept costs. Right. And right. we were incurring all kinds of intercept costs running a basic. Mm -hmm. And so by being a paramedic service, we're actually off we're the, the hook for that, and we are actually the one collecting the. Right, intercept. and I think these F sixteen, FY sixteens, were the type of thing where we had multiple units, you know, it was like a plane crash or something like that. We had multiple units responding and treating and multiple drugs and things like that. So it was a very, this is representative of a handful of very expensive ambulance trips that happened to be self-pay that were never reimbursed. Um, they do break it down to self-pay slash insured and uninsured, um, which would be what we've discussed in the past about the insurance company writing that check, that reimbursement check, directly to the individual. And then never paying the bill. Right, um, right. So, so our records show, you, you, had, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had insurance, but we never saw, you know, you never yeah. paid your bill. And um, that's, that's part of what's going in through the legislature right now. Right. Isn't that correct? They're right. trying to, to make they're that trying to swap it. They're trying to keep that going, right? And we were trying and we should be trying to fight it. Exactly. Right. And That's the NRA saying. is, I believe, trying to fight it. Yeah. We might want to check on I that because really I wasn't sure when we that went they were the on our team. The right, the I, the I wasn't sure they were on our team. I think we need a lot more ground uh, ground support getting on MMA and whoever else the legislature to get to get that thing. Of course, filled. we could have misunderstood that, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm just going to throw them a bone and say maybe. Sounds good. But. So someone, asked, someone asked me the other day about a bill. They got they got a bill, mm -hmm. and they said, "Well, why is the bill a thousand dollars?" It was like a thousand dollars or in that dollar. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, it's easy." And they said, "What do you mean?" I says, "Well, we know how much our service costs. We know, we know it costs us about what one point one one point two million dollars total a year, mm -hmm. and we make about a thousand a thousand runs. So, I mean, so it's easy for us to know, and that you get billed that amount." Um, and and I, I thought it was an easy billing mm -hmm. equation. Yeah, we get from Comstar provides us annually with a breakdown of other communities, our size, similar demographics, and what their billing rates are. And we are we're not at the top and we're not at the bottom. I mean, we are on average very similar. It's that Probably. that we can yeah we can well, see that. Well, that. you 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 have it here like. We we charge one point four almost one point five million dollars, and and we actually collected six hundred thousand. Right. I mean, and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's largely because of Medicare, Medicare, and Medicaid. But that's why we are so fortunate because we have a lot. We have a stable percentage of private insurance. insurance. Right. That's, that right. Right. So, so that's why a lot of people don't yeah. have the insurance. Right. The other, right. if everybody well, has percentage, a percentage wise, Medicaid, it's probably Medicaid. They have problems. But in terms of total dollars, it's probably Medicare. Oh, right. Right. I'd love to talk to an insurance company and say this is what it actually, <laughs> you know, when you get a car, when you get your car fixed after you had an accident, you go, I mean, what what is the, what is the auto body shop 
charge they charge what it costs to fix your car. I mean, right, right. But Tom, the difference is, I, I would, I would, you know, you know, is that when you get your car fixed, your appraiser goes over to the auto body shop and they agree on the price ahead yeah. of time. Right. Yeah. Where that doesn't happen with an ambulance situation and. And and we we had the conversations with all the insurance companies, and they were just like, it's, it's the way it goes, and they had us completely over a barrel, um, and, and which is and but and, 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 and I was as you well I, can imagine, I was sure. all bent out of shape about it, and I finally said, all right, it's not worth having a coronary and being one of the patients someday. <laughs> Uh, but the, but they complain about the price. It was right. <laughs> but Zach, the question that I have, which is the most troubling one for me, because I get the the fact that we that there's yeah. allowables and whatnot. It's when we're not collecting, and it's not a big amount of money. So it must be a systems thing. We're we're not collecting 100% of the allowable. Right. That's the. I right. mean, if it's not allowable, you know what? The guys, right. why aren't we collecting 100 percent of the allowable? That's a great question. I don't have a, a full, solid answer for that. I, I know that sometimes Medicaid or Medicare will dispute charges. Um, that is part of what they do when they reimburse things. Um, my wife works at a community health center, and she experiences this all the time. That I don't, and I don't know whether that's a result of that or whether it's a result of information. If if this is the type of thing where our patient care report says that, oh, we gave medicine X, but it's not documented correctly, and so then Medicare says we're not going to, you know, so like if there's a discrepancy there, this is what we need to drill down and figure well, out. Blue Cross has the same issue. Right. Well, it's so, not a lot of money, but. Yeah, right. $10,000 right. is $10,000. Right. right. I, I have a question, Jack. Excuse me, Jonathan. Sure. Do, do we use generic drugs or we use. Uh... Oh, only name brand, only FDA approved. I was just wondering because you could dispute that. You know, someone says, you know, yeah, oh, okay. I, didn't, well, yeah. I didn't use uh, CVS aspirin, I used Bayer. Did you, you guys know? go shop on uh, well, the Canadian exchange? Well, yeah. we, some, some of the drugs we use are generic drugs, but there's the drug name acetaminophen or something, yeah. or um, diphenhydramine is a good one, is Benadryl. So we bill for diphenhydramine, whether it's Benadryl, you know, Bayer brand, or whether it's something else, it, that wouldn't happen. But those costs are going to be different if it's name, if it's brand, or if it's Yeah, generic. absolutely. And a lot of what we do when we work with the hospital pharmacy where we buy our drugs from is negotiate this very type of thing about the where, what company is providing the drug, what formulation is it in, what container is it, is it in. I mean, we talked about this with EpiPens. When they were $500 a pen, we worked with the hospital pharmacy and they were able to find a off-brand EpiPen for $200. The used ones. Yeah. Right. So, so this is, this is, <laughs> this is part of what we do, right, is, is we try to find cost savings when it comes to things like that as well. It might take two EpiPens to get your treated. It might, right. Yeah. The, the other question, and it goes to what Tom was saying in, in terms of the formula. I guess I would have assumed that, and, and maybe I don't know, some call takes 10 minutes. Some calls, you're on the scene for an hour, mm -hmm. perhaps, or maybe longer. Are we, to use a bad phrase, clocking in and out in terms of detailing how long each call is? Because one call is going to cost us more money than right. a, short, a short call where we get told to go home. There's, there's three different levels of emergency response. There's a BLS transport, basic life support, and then there's two ALS, one and two. And those tiers are based on how many interventions are done. So once you give two or more medications, it counts as an ALS two level. And all three of those have a different base rate. So that's, that's your base rate, the base fee for that call. On top of that, um, every drug we use, um, everything like that, um, has a fee associated with it and, and mileage and mileage. So that's kind of that mileage you would say, you know, is indicative of the wear and tear on the ambulance and things like that. But it's also an indication of how long that skilled provider was tied up. That a two mile transport on average is you're going to use a paramedic 
for less amount of time than a 15 mile transport. So we bill per mile as well. Um, it's a small amount, it's like $9, $10 a mile or something like that, um, but, but that's kind of how we reflect that. We're not clocking in, we don't, nothing about the bill actually shows you know, how long we spent with the patient. So a, a major accident on 91 that you get called to. Yep. That you're out there for an hour and a half, potentially. Yep. That, those hours aren't. No, it would be, a, no, it is a higher cost. It would be billed exactly the same as the person who walks out their front door, climbs in the ambulance, meets us when we pull up and we just drive to the hospital. Yeah, there's no, there's no reflection of the actual That's time. Interesting. Time, times are acknowledged on the run sheets, but they don't reflect anything in our billing. Right, because if we've got one of our call, and you know, EMS people, they're billing by the hour where our staff is on the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our costs are going to go up. But okay, yeah. just so yeah. I know, that's fine. Okay. But is there a reason for that? Why we don't bill yeah. by the hour? Uh, beyond that it's just the way we've always done it. I, I don't know. No, I, I, think, know. I think it's I, set up, I mean, that's like, how the insurance companies pay. They don't pay. Right. I mean, if I submitted a bill for time, they would just look at it and be like, you kidding me? Like, I don't, what is this? And I think what they're billing for is skills used. Right. You know. And drugs used. But, but like what, you, what Jonathan was saying is very interesting because if you go to somebody's house and they cut their arm on the lawnmower and they're bleeding and you take care of putting the ambulance and you know whole thing's 20 minutes versus you go to a farm mm -hmm. where the guy's tangled up in the PTO and you know you can't get the arm out and you've got to work on him and you might be there for an hour or two or three hours right. to save this life right. because they've got to cut the machinery. I didn't need that visual. Yeah, but okay. I, well, and, and those are, but those are certainly... But you know, yeah. and, and, and so now while the ambulance is tied up, you, you might get another call mm -hmm. and then we have to call an intercept. You know, so I can really see that. So you couldn't bill for an extended time and the insurance company said, well, look, at, you know, we didn't, we didn't just go and take this no, to the hospital. There's we no, to take care of them. All there's the no time. mechanism for that. Those are the outliers. I, the one thing to know is that with our full-time staff, with our call staff that we keep engaged, because they're more efficient, um, they feel better about their job, they're more competent, um, for want of a better term, they are able to do calls faster because they are full-time and they are used to the equipment. So our full-time staff, statistically, will do a call in shorter amount of time than our call staff and our volunteers just because of how, they, how comfortable they are with the whole system and how it works. Yeah, but, but I, again, I'm throwing darts here. Yeah. I'm going to throw a dart that says if I make an appointment with my doctor and I spend 15 minutes with him, he's going to bill X. Mm -hmm. If I spend 45 minutes with him, he's going to bill Y. He's not going to say, well, it's my skill. He's going to get his hourly rate. If you call your lawyer and you, <laughs> I mean. Actually, Jonathan, lawyers are hourly, but your doctor's bills, when they go to submit to the insurance company. Yeah. It's the same visit is going to be paid the flat rate. Yeah, really? yeah. It's, it'll be like annual checkup, and they'll pay X. So if it that's is. why, regardless of time. Yeah, and that's why they push you out so fast because if they can get more annual checkups in, yeah. No, that it's, a, it's an industry thing because you, you have yeah, a wreck on the highway is. that, like the, the highway guys that are coming, they bill for the light setup, they bill for the extra truck, the cleanup crew, they bill for yeah, all that, that stuff where it's not. It's not right. It's not. No, I know a guy in the industry. All right. <laughs> he does okay. well. All right. So, so moving on, I, you know, if that—that's where we stand now. I mean, obviously, it's it. If you read between the lines, we can identify some areas where we have some questions and things we need to get on um, the squared away. This flowchart looks overwhelming, but um, I made it Good. as an indication of what is our billing process look like. Um, this is to understand from start to finish how we bill all the different avenues. Anything in the uh, diamond is South County EMS's responsibility <coughs> as far as either making a decision or taking an action. Mm -hmm. um, anything in an oval is Comstar's responsibility. Um, and you'll notice that it's actually those dotted lines. That middle chunk is all Comstar. That's all our billing company. That's everything that, that they do for us. Um, so when you drill it down, John's getting his. <laughs> when, when you drill it all down, basically it comes down to um, early on, 
uh, how do I want to phrase this? There are three ways we can go with uncollected debt. I'll say that. That's on, this is on the next page. Mm -hmm. um, we can write it off as uncollectible. That we will never see a penny of this. We're never going to get it back. We just need to write it off as uncollectible. Um, and based on conversations Wendy Foxman had with counsel, debt older than six years is kind of like, OK, if it's older than six years, you're not good. You just don't even, yeah. It, it took a conversation with a lawyer to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> maybe, well, it might have been uh, a lawyer friend, but it was just, I, all right. Um, the other one would be missing an uncollectible patient information. So this would be our John Doe's or something like that. Somebody who gave us a false name, they're from out of town, they're involved in a car accident, something like that, where when we get notification from Comstar that there's missing information and they need a correction and we go looking for it, we just can't find it, that, that would be uncollectible. We don't, we don't even know who the person is, that John Doe. Um, and then the third option here, and this was uh, based on conversations I had with other services and, and their models and their policies, is if the patient's a minor, um, that we wouldn't go after the parents for you know, an accident that their kid had or something like that. Um, well, the parents have insurance on their children. This would, this would be assuming that there is money left over that has not been paid. Um, so this is just uncollected debt past that 120 days. Um, um, then our next option would be to report to the credit bureau agency, um, but only do that, not send a collection. So only reporting it to the credit, credit agency. Um, and in this case, my recommendation um, would be anybody who applied for a financial hardship but did not qualify. So. They took steps, they said, you know, we feel that we cannot pay this, is there anything we can do? The financial hardship form I include on here, it's based on uh, poverty line mm -hmm. information from Health and Human Services. So that's kind of a, a standard for that. So anybody who does not qualify for hardship but asked for hardship, um, it would seem to me appropriate to say, okay, well, if you feel you can't pay the money, okay, but it's gonna negatively affect your credit or something like that. And then the other option here would be debt less than $150. So this would be somebody's got a copay of $75, $100, and they're just not paying it. Um, is that worth sending to a collections agency for $100? Um, and based on the other policies that I've read um, and consulted for this, it was like, you know, if it's less than $150, um, it's, it's not worth um, doing that to, to the individual. After you applied three times or whatever, sent three letters or whatever. Yeah, so, right, yeah. The only time I would change, because these are oftentimes going to be one instance, the only time I would change that is if, you know, unfortunately somebody might might need an ambulance call twice. Sure. If that number all of a sudden goes above 150, it's cumulative, it's not. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Just like, just like if you don't pay your copay and you go to the doctor, right. eventually it's going to go to the yeah. collection agency. Right. They're not going to see you. Um, of course, they'll just shame you every time you go. I know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> and also, when the patient gets to the hospital, you collect the information from the hospital on the patient's insurance information. Right, and that's and, and that's often that how your, yeah, that's often how we get the patient information. I mean, we're not in the middle of treating a patient's emergency. We're not asking for their we don't insurance card or something, something like that. We dovetail that into the conversation the hospital has. Um, right. And then the third situation would be report to the credit bureau and. Um, refer to the, a collections agency, um, and this would be debt greater than $150, cumulative, no response or communications from the patient at all, um, uh, and or individuals <clears throat> that we, we know that the reimbursement of the payment from the insurance company was sent to the individual. Um, so that situation that we were talking about earlier, um, we know they received the money and they just didn't forward it to us. Is there a way, when an insurance company pays a bill, they send you a copy of what they have paid and what they have not paid. Mm -hmm. Is there any way for scams to get sort of a CC on that so that we know? Maybe we already do. Because then we've got really down in paper, okay, yeah. it was a $75 copay or whatever it is. Yeah. Then, we, then we know. 
letter Yeah, um, the, the bills that, yeah, absolutely. The bills that Comstar sends list all that out. It says, we received this much from your insurance company. This is the remainder. You're responsible for it. You know, call us or call, and so that's all information that, that we have access to. Okay. Um, when we, the aging reports, when we're making these decisions, the aging reports that we will get, we'll give a brief kind of one-line statement about what they know, either, you know, like, didn't pay copay or no, no, didn't hear from patient or something like that. We can request specific information beyond that. If we're having trouble, you know, figuring out what's going on, we could ask a per, per uh, patient basis. Um, and then moving on, uh, the two pages here is the uh, draft ambulance write-off policy. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Brenda, town accountant, uh, for Deerfield for helping put this together. We, again, consulted other policies um, to find the language, and uh, this is what we came up with. I already see uh, a couple misspellings, so that's uh, still a draft, but... So you put this on the agenda to vote on next time, Jack? This might just be because we're trying to collect old money, too, here? Yeah. Right. I think so. Yeah, you guys should write that out. So we want to vote on this next month? After we uh, study this? So you, yeah. you, you'll, back you'll, you'll, you'll send us a clean-up version? And yeah. Jonathan, you get that? What? If you have anything you want to change in the policy, can you forward it to, uh, forward it to Zach and we'll vote on this next month? Yeah, I'll clean it up yeah, and make sure it's, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Zach. Yep, yeah, and then I think, uh, lastly, I included, we talked about this, and uh, John, I did confirm with Comstar that South County EMS is the name okay. on, on everything. Um, the, uh, what we saw was a, a gross kind of, he threw something together and, and for it, yeah. I had a quick question. Who um, who evaluates the bills? Is it just somebody in, in our department, or, or does anybody in South County EMS look at it and go, okay, this was for this, this we should go after, this we should, and so, that's in this. So, so that's what we will need to do. So on that flow chart, that'll be part of our responsibility. So, right. so we will get a group. There's a group here. Or a subcommittee or whatever. Right. It'll, it'll be South County, something. our department's responsibility to determine, okay, you know, under these, what is the circumstance and, and what is our decision on this? And then we just forward that decision back to Comstar and they right. they take it from there. So maybe it's so, the committee of this board will probably look at it at yeah. some point. So in the town of Sunderland, we, allow, we always, I, I don't know about what you guys did in other towns, but we always allow the uh, yeah. ambulance director to, yeah. to review those and make recommendations to us. He never gave us names, he just gave us numbers, right, Bobby? Right. He gave us, he gave us numbers. Yeah. Um, well, what, what we did in Sunderland, we never, on a, on a hardship, yeah. um, we always left that up to the ambulance director. Okay. We review everything. Sure. And then whatever once a year once every six months whatever he would he would uh send us a recommendation yeah by by you know would never have a name he'd just say number one number two whatever and we we would just vote at that no. time right on. and with a policy with some guidelines something objective you know i would feel comfortable bringing that back to the board i just didn't want to not have anything yeah it seems to me though that, that at some level of a committee might be a good idea because zach might you know, you were able to do that in Sunderland because you knew the people. Where Zach might not know if the people are in town, I'm saying. He may not know the true hardship specifics. Well, we never got names, though. Oh. We just looked at... We, oh, we got names. Uh, we, we stayed... We told yeah. Bobby we didn't want to know names. Yeah, we got names. Because then you say, oh, yeah. We, we knew. Yeah, well, and, and on the... The very last page is a hardship application. This is directly from Comstar. If they request this, this is what they receive. Um, and there's a place for the individual right on this form, this fo form to 
explain you know why they feel so even if you know they don't meet the hardship requirements based on their income but they say you know well sure I'm making this money but realistically most of it's going to my you know yep. aging family or something so yep. this would be the place where you know like without a name according to the formula they would fall under X but based right. on what they wrote maybe something else would be more appropriate mm -hmm. um, right I think a subcommittee can meet, though, without having um, become public record. I would right. have to look into it. Yeah, I mean, or the way, even the executive way session, if it's... Yeah, the way we well, but, you know, it doesn't and, and qualify yeah. for executive session, mm -hmm. but... You can deduct names on a public record. Uh, I, I there would, is something you can do that you I would, don't I have would to say be, for, that you don't have, have a subcommittee to, of three. Yes, you, you, it would well, be a small... If you have a subcommittee of three, you, you, you may not be a staff committee. Well, no, but one. then maybe you can have two with staff. I mean, just two people then. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get the answer to that. I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll clean this I policy mean, up to, and we'll figure it out. We have to figure it out under yeah. the new open yeah. meeting laws. Yeah, um, and and the, other, the only other thing that I included in here, um, which we talked about at the last meeting, was the language in that collections notice. Yep. Yeah, I rewrote it. Um, it's I rewrote basically the first three paragraphs. Um, that's the draft. Um, yeah, it says dear patient, patient. Yep. Um, that's what I wrote, um, and I added a thing about if you believe you may qualify for financial hardship or reduce assessment or you wish to, you know, blah blah blah. Make it very clear that you know this is you owe us this money because of a contract you entered into with us, but but. We're not savages, you know. Like, right. please reach out to us. You know, there are options available, and, and we'd like to. Um, okay. yeah. I wonder whether that letter should should perhaps come from the town of Deerfield on behalf of South County EMS, only because I really don't think that the service providers want to get in the game of chasing money. Because if I'm a patient, I want to trust you guys. I want to. Oh yeah, no, yeah. That, no, I. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I I think maybe I missed something with you. This would be a letter that came from Comstar. This would okay, be Comstar. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So after after yeah. the 120 day bill or whatever, this is this is what yeah, they yeah, get yeah. sent. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so right again, all totally handled by Comstar, um, and it would only be after this goes out that we would get down that flow chart to the point where we would have to make a decision on on what we did with that. Okay. Um, so, so the thing that we're following up on, Zach, I just want to make sure my notes are clear, is that we're going to follow up on why we're not getting 100% of the allowable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's off only a little bit, but, yeah. but as Jonathan says, I mean, maybe it's a quick fix, and that's a few thousand dollars. Yeah, right, like, right. Over the course of a year. So 100% um, allowable, and then just we're, we're going to um, finite or determine what what we're missing um, in this flow chart. Is that what, what we're talking uh, no, about? No, I was going to clean up the policies, um, make sure it's it's totally reflective of of what we talked about. Yeah, but wasn't then, there a question on the flow chart? Was, wasn't that what we were talking no, about? Was, no, the, the, we were going to remember the letter. Oh, the letter. OK, yeah. just the letter. All right. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was worried that we were kind of flow chart. No, no. Okay. Zach, remind me again. How the annual income numbers came about because the 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 mean family income for a family of four right now is in the ballpark of mid fifties. But on the other hand, forty nine two for a family size of four is I don't think it's very close to the poverty line. So I, I'm wondering whether we need to know, at the very least know where these numbers yep. came from, but. Oftentimes you're, you know, within 200% of the poverty line, whatever it is. Okay. Um, Maybe it's not even updated. What, 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 what? Maybe this is a this be, Oh, it might be. I don't yeah. know. That's why I just at least know the rationale, if not. Right. Because we should be able to point to that chapter and verse. Here's how we came up with the numbers. It just wasn't. Yeah, my understanding, it was based on the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services assessment for that thing, but I will double check. Right. And it should be regionally, too. Yeah. Because when the, the poverty line. Yeah, well, yeah it, it, it should be similar to the CDBG block grants. That, Whatever. That, yeah. That number. That, right. that, sets, that sets your income. Right. Yep. Where you're, you, when you can apply. I mean, 
It gives us a basis, at least. And we should have it adopted in paper trails. Yeah. Yeah. Or we, but yeah, you're right. You should define what that number is so it, so it self, itself regenerates when right. it needs to. Right, right. So it's actually pulling out of the backside. You know, right, right. But, it, but you want it to upgrade automatically instead of just getting caught at one number. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a month to plan. absorb this and then we'll come back and vote on it in November. Jack, good job. Yeah, good job. Good job. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jack. It's been a long time coming. A lot of work for him. Yeah, a lot of work. Um, the other thing on the um, agenda was the IMA review. Um, we had uh, one based on dissolving in the language that was drafted up. But the other thing is we had talked about that, I mean, we're talking 18 months ago now, 12 months ago, where we had drafted up changes to the IMA or something like that, and that kind of just fizzled out. Um, I think we need to get if we revisit the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. including yeah. this other language, which right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Council needs to look at that and all that kind of stuff. So I think we'd punt that for a while. And, and that's yeah. fine. I just wanted to mention it because I, Wendy and I have been talking about it, how even before she came back, you know, we had at least identified areas in the IMA that need to be addressed. Um, and, and we have yeah, yet. So, um, and I think that's it for me. Okay. All right. Anything else any board members have that want to discuss? Thank you for your work. Thanks and, uh, for coming. Yeah. Oh, for for uh, for Zach. No, any other discussion? Zach finished his discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. That was very good. Oh, Zach, I know we have, we don't you don't know anything about the new building, but have you drove by it lately? Yeah. How's it work? It's a hole in the ground. We go. We got the hole. Yeah, we got the hole, and um, some right? better. Yeah. yeah, make sure you pack your willies for the winter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, natural light though. <laughs> a lot of natural light. A lot of natural light. light. Yeah. Um, we're going to start um, in the very near future thinking about anticipating what we're going to need to to get your furniture list. So yeah, right, exactly, and and uh, equipment and stuff like that. So okay. we'll be going down that road in the next. I'm sure I'll have something for you next month on that. So. Okay. So. Because because there were municipal that's a municipal thing, we can use any we can use any contracts out there, right? The municipalities or you mean on, on the bid the bid? Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so we could actually use a, the MHEC, the Mass Higher Education, Massachusetts Higher Education Collaborative bid and stuff. Yeah. Right, I'm confused. What are you talking buying, about? From buying stuff, you buying stuff, you buying stuff, you furniture and stuff like that. System. Oh, get good deals. Well, it, well. Well, you can get reasonable. I mean, you can get good prices as far as you know an estimate. Mm -hmm. and it gives you a night. There, and there's contract. There's contracts out there that yeah, that the state enters into. So and one, I know fur, furniture is one of them. So. Yeah. But that will also give Zach a real good estimate, and then if he can find something cheaper, then he can buy something cheaper. Yeah. Remember, you get what you pay for. I know, I know. I'm just saying, it get, it's to go on to the the state system is a good is a good start. Well, basis to start. I I was real upset with Deerfield a year ago. We spent ninety thousand dollars on a new pickup truck, and uh, I just bought one, the exact same thing, except it does not have a diesel motor, for forty thousand dollars less. So. Well. I know. I'm just saying that, you know. Who's, whose arm did you twist? I didn't twist anybody's <laughs> arm, but, you know, just going through the, all these state things, they're, they're, I mean, just, you saw the thing about the animal control thing, you know, oh, what, yeah, that bill, that cruiser that we bought for Dick, I mean, the state wanted $32,000, and I ended up getting it at uh, Markoff Ford for $22,000. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I so no, don't get me wrong. I, I think it, it gives us a plate. I I would think you, you use the state bids to get you get numbers. You shouldn't pay more than you know that's, oh, right. that, that's what that, I mean. It's a good it's a good reference. You, I, you need to not. I'm, I'm not advocating buying from those, but just to get pricing. Mm -hmm. 
and, and then because then you know it, it gives you a, a place to start from. Okay. Because we all, like you said, we all know some, sometimes you can use a, the contract and you can get an outstanding price, and sometimes you use an unbelievable price, and sometimes you, it says, "What the heck am I paying for here?" Yeah. So, but you have to be smart about how you. Right. I mean, it does. I mean, sometimes they work out, and sometimes it's not. Absolutely. And it also depends on what you're buying, you know, yeah. how many choices you have. If there's one a sole source, it's, it changes the whole situation. Too. Mm -hmm. Any questions from our audience? No, sir. Okay. I've well, missed yeah. you over the summer. Uh, thank you. And it's also, you haven't been out yeah. golfing. Thank you. All right. Yes, I was golfing, sir. So. See? Can you take a motion? Adjourned, motion please. Adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye.